Hello, welcome to, to this event. Hi everybody, great to see you here. Um, today we, we will have a presentation on uh, sustainable innovation and EU regulation paving the way forward. And um, just to give you a bit of an overview over the topics that we will cover in this very short session, um, we will just introduce ourselves and tell, say a few words why we are doing this. Um, we are going to give you a very quick overview of the online program that we have created together with some pretty amazing colleagues. And we are going to give you an overview over um, the very fresh EU regulation when it comes to sustainability reporting and try to figure out how we can connect to um, business strategy and innovation strategy. We are going to also give you a case on how to, to do this and some information of how to register in case you want to join our program and learn more. My name is Fernanda Tor and I'm the CEO of Next Agents. And I'm Evelina Lundqvist and CEO of The Good Tribe. And without um, further ado, we, we, we want to, to give you an overview of this, uh, of this online program we've created. So what we have been um, seeing is that there's so much value in connecting sustainability to innovation to really drive transformation in organizations. And sometimes this message is not coming across. It's still seen a bit of, as, as, as a hassle. Uh, really, and we want to change that. So therefore, we got together uh, and created uh, this online program exactly on the intersection of innovation and sustainability. And this online program has five modules. It covers very diverse uh, topics from um, AI and digitalization, future thinking and scenarios, branding, culture, to, to this session, regal requirements, innovation strategy, the ISO for innovation management and how to integrate it with sustainability, and just a bit of an overview over what's happening in this very um, complex uh, and uncertain field. So these are five modules, um, and then each module has uh, 10 sessions. These sessions have each one a task. Um, they have uh, extra information for deep dives. They have reflection questions. They have um, quizzes and summaries to really make you feel empowered and comfortable in, uh, in diving in this, uh, in this topic. And we really have built this program in order to create impact and drive action. So we need to do this. We need to drive this transformation. So how can we feel comfortable in driving it? So all the tasks are um, tasks that you can use for your own organizations. And we want you to just get started, create this idea of uh, bias for action. And then we also have the live sessions, one per module, where we come together and we discuss these very important topics. It's very important, this peer-to-peer -peer learning, and we also create a peer-to-peer -peer opportunity within, uh, within this program. We've been having some really, really good feedback, so thank you so much for all the participants in our program. It has been an amazing experience, so we're very happy for this very positive feedback. And if you want to learn more, please join us in our website, download the brochure, get in contact with us, write us an email. We're here, we're here to help and we're here to learn. We, we love to learn. And um, without further ado, let's dive into the EU regulation. Hi again, everybody. I'm super happy to take you through uh, the an overview of some of the regulations that impact the sustainability and innovation space. Uh, as many of you probably already know, there is a lot happening in this space at the moment. And what are we talking a bit about today is the CSRD and also the Green Claims Directive. But there is a lot more happening in this space, ranging from uh, waste to textiles to all kinds of uh, regulations. So there's really a lot happening in this space. Um, let's see if I can also see on the side here. Yes, okay. So the CSRD is the focus topic for today. 
And uh, as you know, the landscape in the EU particularly is changing a lot uh, at the moment. Um, the CSRD is starting to happen this year. Uh, companies are scrambling to put together their first reports, which will be um, published next year. Uh, so there's a lot of companies that are quite confused at what's happening and uh, trying to kind of find their path forward within the CSRD space. Uh, also, the EU taxonomy has been uh, somewhat of a game changer. Uh, we already have that since a couple of years, uh, but that has certainly also had an impact on large corporations. Um, moving forward to the CS triple D, that's a very interesting development. Um, <clears throat> when that comes into place, uh, also not only the large corporations that will have to um, report in the beginning of the implementation of the CSRD will be affected, but also companies along uh, these larger corporations' value creation chains will be affected, uh, since it's all about mapping and understanding, uh, mapping out and understanding the, the value creation chain of different companies, which also, of course, means that companies has, have to change the way that they create, uh, collect data on the products uh, that they um, manufacture and or uh, sell. Uh, so that's a very important development. And then we have also the very new, fresh development with the Green Claims Directive. It was adopted in the EU just a couple of weeks ago um, and is now uh, kind of we're awaiting uh, during a two year per period that uh, the different EU member countries will implement uh, the, this directive into their own national legislation. Uh, so we also need to kind of keep an eye on that, that is actually happening the way that we want it to. Uh, and all of this is part of the EU Green Deal which is a policy package uh, that is kind of intended to uh, reach climate neutrality by 2050. Um, so this is also, especially now with the upcoming EU elections, beginning, beginning of the summer, this is something that we really need to keep track uh, of uh, in the innovation space, in the sustainability space, that th th this is not watered down uh, by any uh, future kind of government constellations, uh, that this is actually as, as strong as we want it to be. Um, so, a bit more in detail uh, on uh, the CSRD, what it actually means. Um, it's, it's definitely more important information for company, larger companies, uh, 250 uh, plus employees, um, 40 plus million euros in turnover and um, a plus 20 million in total assets and of course all listed companies as well. So we're talking larger corporations in the beginning of implementing the CSRD, uh, but this will also change including more companies as we, um, uh, as we go along. Um, this, what, what is also very interesting is that this actually means that 50,000 companies all across Europe uh, have to uh, report according to the CSRD within the coming years. And this corresponds to 75% uh, of all the uh, EU companies' turnover. So this is really a significant number. Um, as I, uh, I think I mentioned previously, this is now be this is the first year uh, where companies has to have to uh, start gathering data. It hasn't the law, uh, the, it has not been implemented in all EU countries' laws yet. So this is also something we need to keep track of. There can be some uh, minor variations of the law in the different countries. Um, so yeah, next year we're going to have a lot of reading <laughs> of the different com uh, company reports. So that's going to be very interesting. And down the line more and more companies will be included uh, in um, uh, on set years but ex exactly uh, how that regulation what that will look like in practice we don't know yet so we need to keep an eye on that as well um, moving on to the green claims directive this is something that is incredibly important I think all of you know what it's like as a private consumer to walk into a store and try to buy a packet of pasta or whatever it is that you're looking for it's very difficult to know what is actually a product that I want to buy that has a minimal uh, footprint uh, it's really, really difficult and consumers all across the EU are very often being de uh, deceived by companies that want to portray themselves as greener uh, than they actually are. So here are some stats um, that kind of was in the, in the package leading up to uh, adopting the 
uh, Green Claims Directive. So 53% of green claims uh, by companies give uh, vague, misleading or unfounded information. That's half. So it's no wonder when you're standing trying to get your groceries that you have no idea what's going on. Uh, this is really, really tricky. Uh, and this is where the EU wants to come in and, and help. 40% um, of the claims have no supporting evidence, which is also rather shocking. Um, this needs to be cleared up. Uh, half of uh, all the uh, green labels offer weak or non-existent um, uh, verification, which is also not a good thing uh, at all. Uh, which uh, and which is also makes it difficult in a B two B space that you can act, I, you don't know as a business what other businesses should I be doing business with if I want to kind of stay on the on the safe side uh, or within the planetary boundaries. Um, and uh, more. Uh, the, the last figure, the 230, uh, is also quite uh, shocking. There, there are 250 sustainability labels and 100 green energy labels in the EU. So it contributes to a lot of confusion. But now, a couple of weeks ago, um, the Green Claims Directive was actually adopted by the EU and it was an overwhelming number of people who uh, voted for uh, this law. So now the countries have a two year period to adopt it into national law, uh, which we're, I think many of us are looking forward to. Um, I am not going to go too much into detail on this one. It's what it is, what is included. We'll talk more about that in the course. Uh, but I think one thing that I want uh, to mention is that companies can no longer say that they are climate neutral. Uh, they cannot get away with only com compensation. Uh, that's not uh, that's not possible any longer. So that's quite a game changer. A lot of companies have been wanting to kind of use that narrative, not possible anymore. And of course, I, I also want to mention the third party verification of uh, different sustainability claims uh, it is also super important. Um, it's, um, yeah, I'm a huge fan <laughs> of third party verifications because then you can have more certainty if you use the EU Eco label, for example, or others. There are a bunch of really trustworthy ones that you, as a consumer, or if it's business to business uh, activities that you're running, that you can actually trust that it is, uh, it's the truth, uh, what you're seeing and buying and reading. Uh, a short summary um, uh, is that the landscape is currently changing. And as a company uh, working with innovation, you need to take the regulation change into account. It needs to be part of your strategies. Uh, it, it will have effects on the way that you innovate in your company. It's super important. And also the Green Claims Directive in terms of how you actually communicate your products and services. Um, I think the main, um, the main idea is that the, these regulations are going to help companies do the right thing and help consumers uh, make it easier for them to make cho better choices. Uh, but it's also a worry that it's maybe too little, too late, and that it's not strict enough that we need to take this even further. And their companies that are spearheading innovation can also kind of uh, push this agenda even further. Uh, that's a really, really good space for, for innovation. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm going to hand over to Fernanda again. Thank you so much, Evelina. Um, so moving forward, um, we, we also wanted, exactly like Evelina was pointing, OK, we really should integrate this with, uh, with strategy. And we wanted to also say a few words about that, about the integration with, uh, with strategy. So um, what we see is what are the main reasons uh, that that businesses should invest when it comes to um, to resilience well you know there's there's the regulation as a pressure of fear just, um, and strategy and it, it makes sense that it's a strategy the kind of the the driving force for businesses to want to become more resilient and what we see here on um, on this data on the on the right corner, this is um, the World Economic Forum um, report on um, the, the global risk report for 2024. Is, is, this is not going to go away uh, and it's going to increasingly become more and more uh, stormy and unstable. So we see that 
even if we feel that we are facing at the present um, very uh, unstable uh, times, uh, it, it, it is in, in fact going to going to get worse. So okay, this 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 is interesting. We we understand that things are going to get um, tougher, but then concretely tough related to what? Well, th this report from the World Economic Forum points out um, in the next ten years. The, by, 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 by topics, the biggest risks, and out of the top five, four are related to climate. We know that this issue is, um, is becoming increasingly important. And what are we doing about it? Well, it's really interesting. Um, so this is data from the um, uh, director, uh, a survey for uh, corporate uh, board directors. And um, it's very interesting that comparing 2022 to 2023, more directors feel that they are comfortable when it comes to ESG disclosures. Uh, you see this from 25 to 51 percent. But looking specifically about the integration from ESG um, at, in the business strategy, you see a decrease from 64 percent to uh, 54 percent. At minus ten uh, percent, so okay, we are more comfortable with the disclosure, with the legal aspects, but we are not really um, implementing it uh, and and um, building it together with the business strategy. In fact, when we when we uh, ask board directors if their boards are discussing climate uh, change. Um, the numbers in 2022 were 51, 2023, uh, 48. So a slight uh, decrease, and still not around 50% are discussing ESG uh, in the boards. Um, why we think that this is a challenge? Well, we think that this is a challenge because if we don't uh, have the the the, the strategy uh, in in organizations in businesses being developed together, considering um, ESG sustainability, then we are not really preparing ourselves for a transformation, are we? Then it's just about the reporting, the disclosure. And uh, what we see on information coming from you, the European Commission on the, um, on the survey to um, European businesses from 2023, we see exactly the same kind of uh, of numbers we see that in the nordic countries where where we are doing this live stream from in the nordic countries um sustainability is seen more uh, as an opportunity um uh, achieving almost the 50 percent but the rest of europe uh, and especially in the south of europe um businesses don't don't really have that mindset yet again be mindful that the best case scenario is still around 50%. Um, so so we, 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 we have to, to do much more. We're a long way from, um, from, from home here. But why is this a problem? Well, <laughs> businesses are missing out on really good opportunities, we believe. Um, so this this is uh, research uh, showing that nearly 70% of um, global companies actually reported higher than expected financial returns on climate initiatives. So you you do something because it's right and it's much better for business than you actually expected. And not only that, but also pace setters so those businesses that have been driving these um these issues um really captured significantly a higher financial value so not only you get a bigger return than you were expecting showing that these uh, uh, opportunities are very good for business but by being the first by having this attitude being the pace setter then, then you really uh, have even even better returns. This is very interesting, and it feels like businesses, organizations in general, 
have not really gotten this message yet. Uh, it's understandable. Uh, okay, there's a lot of regulation, like Evelina was presenting, so therefore it's understandable that you can get a bit overwhelmed. Um, but let's give you um, a concrete example from a business that we think uh, has really uh, did something good with um, with this situation. So I wanted to to just use uh, Paptic as an example and say a few words about them. Super interesting scale up coming out of Finland. Um, great people. Uh, it's amazing to work with them. And um, Paptic has a very interesting material, which is an alternative to plastic packaging. And basically what they did is to innovate in a very old industry, which is the paper industry. They took paper and they kind of put it together with textile uh, to create this. It's thin as paper, but very, very resistant and has very interesting uh, touch properties. Uh, what happened with Paptic, and, and I, I have there the link to, to the very short YouTube uh, video also from them, is um, so in France, um, there was a regulatory change to completely ban plastics and ban plastics for packaging of fruits and vegetables. Um, great measure, but what do you do with it? There were just no alternatives in the market to package uh, vegetables not using uh, plastic. So you basically have that net that holds, for example, the onions, and then you need a little um, plastic tag to, to hold it. And if you lose the plastic tag, then you can't really pay for, for the product, right? Um, so if you use this in paper, it would tear very uh, easily. And you couldn't really use it in plastic. So therefore, consumers and businesses were left with a big problem. We, ha we have this, this way of packaging, but we can't just use it anymore. And Paptic really came in with a very interesting solution. And um, uh, Paptic material runs on the same machine. So it was just changing the, the, the plastic for, for, for Paptic. And it was, as you can imagine, very, very good for Paptic business. But also, and this is the interesting thing about um, innovation, okay, you have a solution that works very well in a context, but you really open for new markets. So what Paptic did next is that they partner up with um, Pukitila, so the, the, the brand that you see there for, um, for onions, and they created a completely new package uh, for for these uh, onions. And very interestingly, Paptic as a material is more breedable. So therefore it actually allows the onions in this case to, to be uh, maintained fresh for longer periods of time. And they won, they won together a World Packaging um, uh, Awards on this, uh, on this package. A very traditional industry that can get uh, disrupted if you use the regulation as a trigger together with innovation to create new new solutions. So I think that hopefully we have been able to give you a bit of an overview on both the regulation but also the opportunities of really trying to not separate regulation from the business, but rather integrate it and, and, um, and use it as a driving force to rethink and transform business. So if you want to learn more, which we, we hope you do, please register to, to our program, keep in contact with us. And um, this, this today was just, an overview over some of the topics that we um, present on module two. Like I said, is module two is um, uh, one of five modules. We're talking about 50 lessons, really going in depth from topics from future thinking, digitalization, culture, branding, regulation, um, ISO for innovation standards, and, and a very broad, broad uh, overview over really what connects innovation and sustainability so that we don't uh, start uh, seeing these as two, two different um, disciplines. 
So the whole idea is the capabilities are similar. You shouldn't have them separate. Let's try to, to do this together. And this, this was us for today, but we have a much bigger team that is delivering this program and making this program uh, possible. Very smart people. We're very proud of being working with them. And um, hopefully you are curious enough to come and join us in, uh, in our program. Before we wrap up and we go to some of the questions that we have in the chat, we wanted to uh, give all the participants from this session uh, an opportunity to register with discount for the program. So we're talking about the 20% discount using the code that you see on the screen. Um, and this will give you a discount if you register to our upcoming uh, cohort. Thank Super. you. Yeah, let's take some of the questions. Yes, we had uh, some questions in the chat, um, mainly regarding uh, how is climate neutrality then actually tested to be verified? It's a really good question. Uh, so um, there are different schemes that a company could use to do that. Uh, first of all, they need to kind of start tracking, mapping what their emissions actually are. And that can be easier for some companies, maybe some companies that are more in the um, service space and uh, a lot more uh, complex for companies that are in the um, product space, especially if you need to start looking deeper into your value creation chain. It might be um, a bit of a challenge, but it has to be done. Uh, and a lot of companies are struggling with this so there's also the opportunity to learn from other companies maybe similar comp companies in your industries that you can team up with and see what they're doing and how they're doing what successful strategies are and then uh, you could always use the uh, the science-based targets initiative for example that's a good one uh, very widely used and accepted um, it's a really good one. And then independently of if it is climate neutrality or other claims uh, that you have in your business, it's always a very good idea to get a third party verification because it says it's not only you claiming something, but somebody who has the legitimacy to actually test it uh, has also done that. Uh, so uh, to reach out to a standards institute or an, an audit firm, uh, of course, a lot of big audit firms are doing, uh, doing a, a good business uh, on this development. Uh, so it's really good to reach out to them to get help uh, by companies that, are, uh, that have a lot of uh, legitimacy in this space. Uh, so there are several ways to go about it and but it's also and it's also really good to have some time to not not stress into these processes even though there is a bit of time pressure now depending on the size of your uh, company but to actually um, have create a good plan on how to move forward and see how others are doing it and kind of move confidently into this space mm -hmm. we also have here another question coming in um, it's a question related in relation to the, the the strategy how to how to implement it then how to implement this integration of sustainability and uh, business strategy um well I, I i would say and to pick up on on the last words from evelina it's really about developing capabilities in the organization right when you have a strategy you also need to implement it and put it in practice so what you want is to have the strategy to have a plan but also develop those capabilities so you're able to develop the um, to, to actually implement it so one of the things that we talk a lot about uh, in the program is trying to look at both um, sustainability and innovation from a systemic perspective. This is not just a one initiative that you do once and check, this is done, but rather about creating a system of capabilities that you can continuously develop so you're able to adapt over what's happening and that you're able to deliver continuous um, sustainability-driven innovation. This is not something that happens once, once, and like I said in the beginning of the presentation, it's just going to get more and more complex. So the sooner we get started, it will, it will we believe, really give um, a very interesting advantage when it comes to, when it comes to the future. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions uh, coming in? We have some cheering. <laughs> <Super>. <laughs> That's, That's also important. <laughs> yes, also for Paptic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very important like. Thank you so much for, for being here and being with us. 
And uh, let's keep in contact. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.